Good morning. God's already been present. Amen. I'm going to get a little closer to you guys. I like you. Thanks. We got a new... No, just leave it right there. Thanks. Just trying to take my breakfast. That was my fault. I told him I was going to put it down there. But so. We got a new series starting today, so we all excited? Yeah. This series is called uh, I Am God's Plan for God's People. And uh, understanding that the name of God is not random. He didn't, he, didn't dis, he didn't give his name. He didn't share his name with Moses that day in the desert because he just thought it up that day. His name is actually a blueprint for his plan. Not just a plan that started at creation. Not just a plan for Israel throughout the Old Testament. Not just a plan for the New Testament church. It's also a plan for your everyday life. For my everyday life. And it's embedded into his name. It's, it's in there. God's plan is sometimes obscure. But it also can be obvious. It's sometimes mysterious. But it can also be majestic. It's sometimes reticent. But you know what? So many times, it's a revelation in your life. God's plan for God's people. In this series, we want to help you see God's plan that's in his scriptures. And trust me when I tell you, once you start to see God's plan in the pages of his word, you will not be able to stop seeing it. And you'll be able to capture it for your own life. And understand that sometimes it's a little obscure, but so many more times it's amazingly obvious. And yes, it can be reticent, but when you see it, it's an amazing revelation. Let's pray. Father God, I praise you and thank you for your plan that you've given us in your word that sometimes it takes a while for us to see it, but when the Spirit of God opens our eyes, we begin to see your plan, and we can see it again and again and again. We can see it in the pages of Scripture. We can see it in your people. We can see it in your church. We can see it in your creation. It's everywhere. It's on the move, and it is not stopping because you have put it into place. Lord, as we go through this series. It's my heart that each one that hears the messages of this series will begin to take what they hear and take what they see through your word and start to use your name as a lens for their life. Because only then will they see the revelation that you have for them, a plan and a purpose because they belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I am, we hear this name because Moses was given the name by God. He was given, he was told the name by God to bring to the people of Israel. Israel was in bondage. See, I want to share the whole story with you. The problem is, is that it starts in Exodus chapter 3 and it doesn't finish until Exodus chapter 12. So it's a lot of reading. So I'm going to give you the JIV version. That's the Jeff International. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to work through it. But I am going to go to Scripture when we need to hear from the very Word of God. So Israel is in bondage in Egypt. They're crying out to God. They've been in bondage for 400 years. 
And, and Moses, you know the story is he's born, and, but Pharaoh is killing all the babies two years old and younger. His mom puts him in a basket, floats him down the Nile. He's picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, and he's raised in the palace of Pharaoh, the best education, the best of everything. And then later on, he realizes that he is a Hebrew. He is Jewish. He's part of the sl actually slave community by blood. And he starts to see one of the uh, Egyptian uh, overseers beating a Hebrew slave. And he gets angry and he fights the Egyptian and kills the Egyptian. And he runs off into the desert. Now he's out in the desert and he's herding sheep and he gets married and he's working for his father-in-law. And all of a sudden he sees a burning bush. But the bush is not being consumed by the flames. And we're going to pick up the story right there. See, you've got a pretty good, pretty good quick version there. So we're going to pick up the story right there. Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 3. And I'm going to read 1 through 8. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, I am here. He says, do not come any closer, God. God said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm going to move down to verse 10. So now... Go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So it's important to understand what's happening there is that there's a holy God and he introduces himself to Moses through a holy fire. The fire is visible. Moses is not standing right where the bush is. He's far off and he sees the glow and he approaches the glowing bush and he realizes that there's a fire but it's not consuming. But he's drawn to it. He wants to see what it is, what's happening, what's going on. That's important. A holy God introduced by a holy fire. And then a holy God introduces holy ground. See, there's a difference between where you are standing now and where you are invited to stand. See, God sees where you're standing right now, and he's inviting you to take some steps. He's inviting you to a different place. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the holy ground that introduces a holy mission. He wants you to take some steps because he has purpose for you, just like he had purpose for Moses. He is going to send him to the people in Egypt. He is going to rescue them. He's going to lead them to the mountaintop experience with God. He's calling Moses. He's giving him a mission. And he's calling you to the same thing. I'm going to read a little bit more, 13 through 15. It says, Moses says to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am 
has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. God's name hasn't changed. His name is I Am. An amazing, an amazing name. That when we just read it off the pages of Scripture in English, it doesn't really jump off like it would if you were a Hebrew, if you were Jewish, if you saw that name, because it's just not I Am. It's also I was, and it's also I will be. The Hebrew word can be translated in any of those ways. And when it comes to God, it just doesn't mean any one of those. It actually means all of those at the same time. The plan of God is not necessarily about your moment. It's about your past and it's about your future. If you can understand that about God's plan for God's people, you see that his name is a blueprint. It's painting what will actually happen in your life and in my life. If we can grab onto this name, I am, I was, I will be. You start to understand who God is, not just in your life, but for your life. It's so important. As things go on, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he sings that famous song, Let my people go. You know, you know how it goes. Just making sure you're paying attention. He tells Pharaoh to let him go, let his people go, and, 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 and Pharaoh keep saying no, and there's ten plagues, and I'm not going to walk through all of those with you. It goes all the way through all these chapters, plagues of blood, that, it, that the Nile River turns to blood, the frogs that are everywhere, gnats covering everything in your nose, in your ears, in your bed, disgusting, flies everywhere. That's the, that's the fourth plague. The livestock gets sick. And boils come on people. There's the next one. Can you imagine having boils all over you? Disgusting. Then a hailstorm that kills all the crops. And then locust comes and eats all the crops. And then darkness comes over the entire countryside. That's the nine plagues that lead up to this final plague. And what it's important to understand about every one of those plagues, and I know I ran through them quickly, Every one of those plagues attacked a god, a false god that the Egyptians worshipped. God was showing Egypt that none of the gods they worship has any power in comparison to I Am. He rendered them absolutely mute and inert and useless as his power was revealed. And we came to the last plague. It's called the plague of death. That death was going to come over the land. And the firstborn of every, every family, firstborn of the livestock, firstborn of the Egyptians, and even the firstborn of Israel would die as death came over the countryside as the final plague. Because did you know that Pharaoh was considered the God of life? Pharaoh himself was considered the God of life. So this plague was attacking the very seat of royalty that all of Egypt worshipped. And as this plague came, they were given instructions in Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to read 3 through 6. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor. Having taken into account the number of people there, 
You are to determine the amount of lamb needed according with each person will eat. The animal you choose must be a year old male without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the side, the sides and the tops of the doorframe of the house where they eat the lamb. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with the bitter herbs and the bread made without yeast. So understand that there's a lamb that has to be slaughtered, a perfect lamb. It's not difficult because we have the whole scripture to understand the picture here, that the perfect lamb is a picture of Christ to come. But this wouldn't happen for 1,500 years. And yet God's plan is being revealed to God's people in the picture of this lamb. John the Baptist declared Jesus as he sees him when he was baptizing people in the Jordan. Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John understood God's plan for God's people. He understood that this Passover season that's being described for the very first time here in Exodus chapter 12, is going to be a picture that's going to unfold through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's going to come to a point where another piece of God's plan will be revealed when Jesus comes to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was a spotless Lamb, which means that it didn't only have to look perfect, By saying perfect and spotless means that it was checked, it was validated. Someone looked it over that it had no spots and no defects. No fault had to be declared for that lamb in order for it to be a sacrifice for death, the judgment of God, death to pass over. And don't you know that as Jesus walked in and was arrested as Pilate and Herod, as he stood before them in their courts, Pilate declared, I find no fault with this man. No spots. Declared spotless, just like the lambs have been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Jesus was the lamb that would be the sacrifice. And in this first Passover ceremony, God is showing us the blueprint for his plan. I'm going to read 7 through 14. Maybe I already read that. You already have that. Let me read that. So the community of Israel, the community will slaughter the lamb. Everyone in the community will slaughter a lamb. Just like 1,500 years later, when the Jewish community yelled out, Crucify him! They slaughtered a lamb, just like they were instructed to do 1,500 years earlier in the very first Passover ceremony. It's all a blueprint of God's plan. The blood would be spread on the doorframe and on the doorposts, the top and the bottom. The blood that came from the lamb that was sacrificed. Now, I have this little prop that I made with some of the lumber I found in my little workshop. And I wanted to get a picture of this. Many times I was told things about the blood being spread and what it meant and what it looked like. And uh, some say that it was put in the shape of a cross as the doorpost went up and it went across. And I thought, oh, that's cool. But I started to see that if it's on both posts and it's on the top part, it's really difficult to pull a cross out out of that symbolism. I started to dig deep into ancient Hebrew language. 
and scholars who've studied the ancient Hebrew language. And I believe that it is exactly what we saw that it was. That they were to take the blood from the lamb and they were to spread it across the top of the door and down the doorpost. Just like the Bible says. But as I kept digging and I kept looking, I found something else that put the piece together for me that I thought I'd been missing for a long time. In ancient Hebrew, this sign is the number eight in ancient Hebrew texts. And in ancient Hebrew, the number eight is connected to the seven days of creation. And on the seventh day, God rests. And on the eighth day, new life began. They equated the number eight in ancient Hebrew to new life. And this sign to anyone who was there means new life. And here's the other part that just woke me up. Verses 21 and 22. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once. This is now it's time to do it. This is the hour. Go at once. Select the animal for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doors. None of you shall go outside of the door of your houses until morning. We've always pictured this as being painted on the outside of the door but it was painted on the inside of their home. New life was on the inside, not on the outside. Because once they painted it, they could not leave. Because death was coming. Judgment was coming. So what is God's plan for God's people? I'm telling you, once you see it, once you embrace it, It'll change everything for you. It'll change everything you do, every decision you make. Because once you understand what God is doing, your eyes will be wide open to what else he's going to do. God's plan for God's people, the burning bush, equals God is not hiding from you. Some people say, I need a burning bush experience before I believe in God. Well, guess what? God has created everything. Everything is his creation. Romans 1.20 says, There is enough of God. His divine nature is seen so that no person is without excuse. God is everywhere. God has preserved his word through all of time. You want a burning bush? God's word is a light unto my path. You want to see a burning bush? God's people, the church, should be a light to this community. We are the burning bush. This is the burning bush. God is not trying to hide himself. He's revealing himself to you just like that burning bush did to Moses. We're here to illuminate, not consume, just like God's light. That's the burning bush. He says to him, take off your sandals for you are on holy ground. God just doesn't want you to walk the steps. He wants you to feel it. He wants you to experience his holy ground. He wants you to make choices because you've experienced the holy God. He has principles for you. Ryan talked about this last week. You want God's promises? Experience God's principles. You will see God's promises in your life. You'll see his plan for you 
but you got to take off your sandals. You have to feel it. You have to touch it. You have to hold it because it's holy ground. And God wants us all to experience him. So take off your sandals. Don't let anything come between you and God's holy ground. Not even a thin layer of leather. Whatever you're putting between you and God, let it slip away and walk on his holy ground. And I am equals he's always present. He was always with you through whatever you went through, whatever hardship you had. He's with you right now as you hear about his amazing plan for your life. And he's going to be with you. He will be there as you move forward with his plan. And he, he had a mission to bring his people out of Egypt. God has a kingdom purpose for you. If Egypt represents the world, then your purpose, whatever it is specifically, has to revolve around you going and rescuing people out of the world and bringing them to the great I Am. Because Jesus came to rescue his people. God's plan. And then the Passover, the Passover that we celebrate through bread and wine or bread and juice is a symbol that new life is written on the inside of your heart. That judgment has passed over each and every one of you. When we take the bread and the grape juice it's just like we're painting that symbol on the inside of our heart. There's new life. We have new life in Jesus Christ. We have new life that we can bring to the world. And every time we partake of new life, we should be remembering this very first Passover that God gave us to show us exactly what he was doing and what he will do for each and every one of us. This morning, I wanted us to experience that together. Can I have our elders, James and Jenny, Dave and Michelle, come up and they're going to have communion trays for you on both sides. I'm going to ask you, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if new life has been written in your heart on the inside, I'm going to ask you to come down and experience the Passover of the great I Am this morning. I'm going to ask you to come down the center aisles where they'll meet you and then go out on the outside and sit down with your elements, take them with you, and we will experience the celebration of Passover together as a family who knows new life in Jesus Christ. As the song plays... You just prepare your hearts and just come down the center aisles and take your elements back to your seats.